Merry Christmas. I had asked the praise and worship team to, to please uh, include that song in their set today. And I have a reason, so you'll understand that a little later. I want to share that uh, with you. But this being Christmas, uh, so often uh, times that you'll find somebody that is not in church uh, maybe since Easter. And uh, uh, some people make light of that a little bit. And they call people that come to church on Easter and Christmas Christers sometimes. And uh, in a way, if we're not careful, we miss the things that God is doing. If you're here and you haven't been here since Easter or in a church since Easter, I thank God for you. I thank God that because his son came to this earth, he set this opportunity for you today that you could understand and know a loving God. You know, the, the scripture in Zechariah says, don't despise the small beginnings or the things that the Lord does because he rejoices in the very work that has begun. And I, I believe that God will begin a work in you. You know, the scripture tells me that he came to this world to save, to seek and to save that which was lost. He came for whosoever will and whosoever will included you. And he desires more than anything else that you would know him at this Easter season. And I want to read a scripture found in Matthew chapter 16 today. I know that it's not a traditional uh, Christmas story. Uh, while you're turning there, Matthew chapter 16, I'm going to begin reading it about the 13th verse. But I uh, encourage you, if you can, be here again next week. I know it's New Year's Eve, but it's also uh, Peggy and my and Emily's last service with you. And we're hoping we just are able to uh, totally capture uh, the love uh, or you are, that we have for you too. And, and hopefully it'll be a day that we will remember. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through 19. And I have the King James Version today because uh, there's some things I have marked in my King James Version Bible that I wanted to include. The 13th verse. It said, When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others says Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever shall be loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. Heavenly Father, today I thank you, first of all, that you sent your son Jesus. There was a determined, it was predetermined that he would come and in the fullness of your time and your timing for us, you would allow him to come and, and change our world to where we could make choices that would forever change our eternity. And God, today I'm asking you if there is even one under the sound of my voice that has not chosen you as their Lord and Savior. The whole reason that you came, God, that today on this Christmas Eve, that they would get the greatest Christmas present that they could ever receive by having you change their lives. God, I depend on you, your Holy Spirit, to do the, make the difference. Not what I say, but what, what your word says. I thank you for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there's popular ideas to who Jesus is. You know, even in the scripture, some called him teacher, or they called him a good master, or they called him different things. But here Jesus was asking, maybe not a popular version, but he was asking, who do you say that I am? And I was reading a blog here this past couple weeks, and it gave 
It was by a man named Kevin DeYoung, and I don't know much about him, but he gave 17 variations of who people say that Jesus is. But only one of them is correct. He said, first of all, there's the Republican Jesus. Any of you know that Republican Jesus? He's the Jesus who's against tax increases and activist judges. He's for family values and owning firearms. You know that Jesus? Sometimes we've painted that that's who Jesus is for our own good. Then there's, of course, if there's the Republican Jesus, there's got to be that Democrat Jesus too, doesn't there? Who's against Wall Street and Walmart for reducing the carbon footprint and printing money. Then there's that therapist Jesus who helps us cope with life's problems. He heals our past. He tells us how valuable we are and not to be so hard on ourselves. Just calm down. There's that Starbucks Jesus <laughs> who drinks fair trade coffee and loves spiritual conversations who drives the hybrid and goes to film festivals. There's that open-minded Jesus. You know the open-minded Jesus? That he understands it all, you know? The one who loves everyone all the time, no matter what, except for people who are not as open-minded as you. You know that open-minded Jesus? There's the touchdown Jesus. Now, how many of you know the touchdown Jesus? Matt, Matt do you know that one? who helps athletes run faster and jump higher than non-Christians and determines the outcomes of the Super Bowl or the Cotton Bowl or whatever other bowl that you're going to be watching this week. There's that martyr Jesus, a good man who died a cruel death so we could feel sorry for him. There's the gentle Jesus who is meek and mild with those high cheekbones and the flowing hair and he walks around barefoot wearing a sash while looking very German. I had to put that in there for the Wapakoneta area. <laughs> There's the hippie Jesus. Who teaches everyone to give peace a chance. Imagine a world without religion. And help us remember that all, of you need, all you need is love. Sounds like the Beatles, don't it? Just imagine. There's the yuppie Jesus who encourages us to reach out to our full potential. Reach for the stars and then go buy a boat. There's that spirituality Jesus who hates religion, churches, pastors, priests, and doctrine, and who would rather have people out in nature finding the God within while listening to the ambiguous spiritual type music. I don't understand this one so much, but it's the platitude Jesus. You ever, you know... Depending on what your platitude is, I guess. Good for Christmas specials, greeting cards, and bad sermons. Inspiring people to believe in themselves. Then there's that revolutionary Jesus. Don't, don't worry, I'm almost to the end. Who teaches us to rebel against the status quo. To stick it to the man and blame things on the system. There's the guru Jesus. A wise, inspirational teacher who believes in you. It helps you find your center. Center. There's the boyfriend, Jesus. Do you know that, Jesus? Some of you single ladies may have identified the boyfriend, Jesus, who wraps his arms around us as we sing about his intoxicating love in our secret place. There's the good example, Jesus, who knows or who shows you how to help people change the planet and become a better you. And then, as this blog closes up, it says, and then there is Jesus, the Son of the living God. Not just another prophet, not just another rabbi, not another wonder worker. He was the one they had been waiting for, the Son of David and Abraham's chosen seed, the one to deliver us from captivity, the goal of the Mosaic law, Yahweh in the flesh, the one to establish God's reign and rule, the one to heal the sick, to give sight to the blind, freedom to the prisoners, and proclaim the good news to the poor. The Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. This Christ is not a reflection of the current mood or the projection of our own desires. He is our Lord and God. He is the Father's Son, the Savior of the world and the substitute for our sins. 
more loving and more holy and more wonderfully terrifying than we could even think possible. Galatians 4, 4 through 7, I think Peggy read this when she was sharing about God being in the process. Galatians 4, 4 through 7 says, And when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so he could adopt us as our very own children, as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the Spirit of God into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. God sent forth his own son, but he said, you were his heir. You're joint heirs with Jesus. You are his son. You're his daughter. You're a part of him. In the fullness of time means just the right time. God's not late. That means he's perfect. He sent forth his son. And I thought about that night as, as we look at what happened in Bethlehem, what happened on the hill with the shepherds. Earlier, we sang the song, Silent Night. And I want to read to you a story. It's a real story. It's a Christmas Eve blessing. Now, most of you, if you're here, you know. But the, you that don't know, I usually don't stand behind there very long. I usually don't use a bunch of paper and all. But today, I just wanted to slow down. And I'm not going to keep you long. But I want to share with you the Christmas story surrounding a blessing. And it may seem odd for a Pentecostal church to talk about a Catholic church, but you know God meets you wherever you're at. He meets you wherever your heart is ready. I believe there are people in all denominations that know and experience the love of Christ. I have read, uh, read some of Mother Teresa's prayers, and I want to tell you, you could not possibly get any closer to Jesus himself when you read her prayers, when you understand what she has said and how she is connected with our Savior. The little town of Oberndorf, Austria, consisted of one winding street lined with quaint cottages and shops. When young Joseph, or Joseph Moore, arrived in 1818 to take the position of assistant priest at the newly erected Church of St. Nicholas. Serving in the parish high in the Triolian Alps, Father Moore soon made dear friends among the local villagers. A favorite acquaintance was Franz Gruber, the village schoolmaster and church organist. Together, these two young men spent much time discussing matters of mutual interest such as education, theology, and music. As Advent approached, you know that time where we look up to the time where we celebrate Jesus' birth. As it approached that year, the two friends lamented the fact that no one had been able to compose the perfect Christmas hymn. As with the custom in the Alpine mountain villages, a group of traveling players arrived in Orbendorf just before Christmas. Their plan was to present a nativity play in the local Catholic church. Unfortunately, the organ at the church of St. Nicholas was repaired, was being repaired, and the church could not be used for the performance at all that year. A local shop owner generously, or generously opened his home to the players, however, and the play was presented as planned on the evening of December the 23rd. Joseph Moore, Joseph Moore, was in attendance that evening. After the performance moved by the beauty and simplicity of the pageant, the young priest stopped on his way home at a favorite viewpoint overlooking the small village of Oberndorf. There, under the sparkling winter stars, Moore's, Moore was moved by the beauty of the night and inspiration of the Christmas story. Returning home, he lit his lamp and as his soft glow wrote the beautiful words, of silent night, holy night. The next morning, Moore took three stanzas of the six lines each to the home of his friend, Franz Grubers. And he said, see if you can wed these words to a melody. Reading through the simple verses, Gruber is reported to have replied, friend Moore, you have found it, the right song 
God be praised. Because there was no hope of the organ being repaired in time for midnight mass that Christmas Eve, Gruber wrote the music for guitar. When the congregation was gathered for the services that evening, Moore sang the tenor part. Gruber sang the bass and played the accompaniment on his guitar while a choir of young girls from the village repeated the last two lines of each stanza to a four-part harmony. The Church of St. Nicholas seemed alive with the beauty of the first Christmas as the clear, pure strains of the original hymn filled that night. Father Moore and schoolmaster Gruber had never intended for their carol to become famous. But when the organ builder returned after the holidays to complete his repairs, he heard the song being sung. Enchanted by both verse and melody, he obtained a copy and he took it with him when he returned to his home in Zitterthal, about eight miles away. Soon as the lovely Christmas hymn was being included in concerts throughout Austria and Germany, billed as the Triolian folk song of an unknown origin. In 1839, Silent Night, Holy Night, was first performed in the United States by a visiting group of Austrian singers. Before long, it was translated not only into English, but into several other languages as well. Without a doubt, it has become the best-loved Christmas carol of all time. Unknowingly, its author and composer had fulfilled their dream of discovering the perfect Christmas hymn. Silent night, holy night. Can you imagine that night? You know, Jesus, in the scripture I read this morning in Matthew 16, it had already been 33 years or more. Here he was, he was saying, but who do you say that I am? You know, you may get to a place where you're with your family. We see Jesus in so many ways. We see him, how he can give us what we want. But who do you say that he is? Is he Jesus, the son of the living God that has come into your life to remove the sin that you could not remove? Has he given you life abundantly? You know, I see some of his family here today, but we were with them last night when Roy Han departed this life in a hospital. And, and I thought how hard it is to think about losing a loved one around the Christmas time. But I thought on Roy's part, and I said this to the family, how wonderful it is that Roy, with all the struggles that he had in his life, all the difficulties, all the health problems, that he was going to spend Christmas with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, knowing Jesus as his Savior. You know, that's all that matters in this world, is that you know Jesus as your Savior. You could have the whole world. You could gain the whole world, the Scripture says, but lose your own soul. And what would it profit a man if you had all of that? But if you know who Jesus is today, if you know who he is in your life, you can say, well, 30 years ago, I asked him into my heart. But who is he to you today? Is he the same Jesus? Is he the savior of your world? Or is he one of those? Is he your Republican Jesus? Is he your Democrat Jesus? Is he the one that just makes you feel good? Or is he Jesus, the son of the living God? Jesus told Peter, Upon your confession. You know, Peter's name meant rock, but he said, upon your confession, Peter, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You, can, you know, there's people that will tell you, you give your life to Jesus and it's going to be a rose garden. Everything's going to be sweet and they're lying to you. There are times you will face, there's going to have troubles. Jesus says, in this world, there's troubles. You're going to have them. But he said, I overcame them all. So you can overcome them too. But when you got Jesus to walk with you, when you got Jesus to walk with you in the valley of the shadow of death, you don't have to fear evil. You don't have to fear anything because this is not heaven. When I watched these little ones up here today, I thought, wow. I don't know what the finished product of these children will be. I said, how cute. How wonderful. I'm going to see them as they maybe later in life grow up. But I thought, how cutesy all these little things are. and 
how it's fun to watch our kids and our grandkids open presents. But this is in heaven. The greatest gift you could ever have is if you ask Jesus into your heart. I want to finish today. I know that Pastor Hall, I think, a couple weeks ago, maybe Wednesday, read it and somebody else read a piece of it. I love the Christmas story, don't you? Because it's from the Word of God. It's not from a book that talks about a hymn. It's from the Word of God. It is the uncompromising truth. Jesus laid it out here. And I looked in the margins. This is one of my older Bibles. And I put down four things here. And I, I thought, more than anything, it was predetermined. It was determined from the foundation of the world that this was God's plan. God, God knew when he created man that he would fail. But he gave him choice. The angels didn't have that soul. But he created man and he breathed into him. And he became a living soul. And he predetermined that no matter what, I'll send my son. And his plan is good. And his plan is going to be accomplished. And his plan, I believe, is almost fulfilled. But I wrote in here that man also had choice. Every one of you have a choice of what you do with this life that you live. Whether you live 40 years, 60 years, 80 years, 90 years or plus. Some of you may make it to 100. But if you gain the whole world and lose your soul, you've lost it all. But I wrote, for some reason here, there was a waiting time. I'm not good with waiting. But the scripture said, in the fullness of time, Jesus came. God sent forth his son. And the last thing that I put in the margin here, some time ago, that he gave us that opportunity. He gave you that opportunity. He gave me that opportunity. What we do with the opportunity means a whole lot. I want to start reading at the first verse, the second cha chapter of Luke. And it said, It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one of them. And Jesus also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto and Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. You know, Matthew spent a lot of time in the first chapter verifying all the lineage to make sure that Jesus came from the lineage of David. Because it was prophesied that way. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the end for them in the end. And verse 8 says, And there was in the same country shepherds abiding in their field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about, round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into the heavens, the shepherds said one to another, Let us go even unto, the Beth unto Bethlehem and see these things, which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. You notice they said, let us go. They had to make a decision. It's time to go. That's a decision everybody's got to make. It's time for me to move. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at these things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary, did you know? 
Did you know all the things? Did you, you ponder? Did you really know? I don't think she could have possibly known at all. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. And then I, I marked the 52nd verse. It's the very last verse of Luke chapter 2. And it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. That means he grew mentally and physically, socially and spiritually. When the time fully came, Jesus did what he needed to do. He went about his father's business. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came for you. Praise and worship team, if you'd come back for just a moment. Oh, wow. I didn't take long at all, did I? That's good. You know, on this Christmas Eve, this might be the first time you've been to church since Easter. It may be the first time you've been to church in a couple of years. It may be the first time you've ever been to church. But isn't it neat how God in the fullness of time sent Jesus and in the fullness of the time of your life, he designates, he decides where you will be. You say, well, no, I, my aunt so-so told me, asked me if I would be here today. And I came for little Susie or Johnny. I wanted to hear them sing. No, God knew where you would be today. He loves you. He's Christ, the son of the living God. And he wants to live inside of you. And you say, well, I already know that. I've, I've already experienced that. Who do you say that I am? Why did he have to ask his disciples? Because I believe there's some here that are saying, well, he used to be this to me. And last year he was this, but I ran into a big problem and I don't see him that way anymore. He didn't hand out to me just quite as good. I get a text this morning and I text back with Matthew chapter 6. Trying to think exactly, maybe 25 through 34. I text back. You know, God himself, he looks over and he cares about the things that matter in your life. He looks at the birds and when they fall into the ground, he feeds them, he takes care of the flowers, he arranges them with clothing. And he cares about you. But if you struggle in life, that hasn't changed who Jesus is because he is Jesus the son of the living God, the savior of the world. He wants to come and live inside of you. And if you don't know him, you can know him today. What greater gift could you ever have? This is an eternal gift. This is not a one-time thing. Of course, you have to follow him. You just don't say, Jesus, I believe in you. And you know, when you believe on him, there's a big difference. There's a lot of people that believe in Jesus. Is there anybody here that doesn't believe in Jesus? If you did, I don't think you'd raise your hand. I'd probably put you in a bad situation. But Jesus says, that's okay. Because I can reveal myself to you. I can speak to you through either gifts of the Spirit or just my Holy Spirit coming and saying, now, this is for you. But Jesus says, I want to reveal myself to you. I want you to be mine. I want you to be my son. I want you to be my daughter. This Christmas season, some of you grew up in church, but you've been far away from God because whatever, a loved one or a sickness or a financial issue has told you or made you disillusioned to who Jesus was. But Jesus says, I'm still that same Jesus that you found when you were a little child, when you were in a Sunday school class, or you in a, or when you heard it from a teacher or whatever it might have been. I'm that Jesus and I want to make myself real to you as I made myself real to the shepherds. It said the shepherds walked away or they went away telling everyone, I want you to be able to go away today. It said that Jesus is the Lord of my life. I don't care if I get another present. I don't care if I get anything else. I just want to love on everyone because I've just been given the love that extends further than when anyone else could give to me. Would you bow your heads? I'm not going to embarrass you. 
I'll give you an opportunity to come up if you want. I do this at funeral services sometimes because it's a little more less intimidating, if you will. But there are times people know that if they died today, they're not sure what their life would be. They're not sure if they go to heaven or not. I'm telling you, if you're not sure, you're in trouble. I'd ask you this question. I want you to ponder on this question. Jesus asked the question to his disciples, who do men say that I am? And when they replied, he said, but who do you say that I am? My question to you is, where are you going to go when you die? Where are you going to go when you die? Well, my aunt went to heaven. My mom and dad are there and I hope to be able to see them. Where are you going to go when you die? You need to know that on this Christmas. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, if you're not sure, if you don't know where you're going to go when you die, would you raise your head and just make eye contact with me? I, will, I won't embarrass you any more than that. Would you just look up toward me and tell me I'm not sure right now? I don't know. Holy Spirit, do your work. Do your work. Holy Spirit, you've seen each set of eyes by just the opening of those eyes. You have an understanding that there's a heart that longs for you. God, if there's others that have not even acknowledged, today they can walk away from this place knowing that you are their Lord and their Savior. Your word tells me if a person would confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart he's raised from the dead that they could be saved. We call that being born again. Being born again says that we believe that Jesus is the son of the living God, that he came to this world, that he took away the sin in our lives, the only one that could take it, that he died on a cross and he rose from the dead. And he today sits at the right hand of the father saying, Father, they're mine. My blood covers them. If that's you today, if you pray in your heart, you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin and come and live. If you can just simply say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Come into my heart. Live. Teach me. Help me. The Word of God says that you're saved. You have to walk with God. You have to keep with Him. But He says He's faithful and He will help you. Amen. 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 Would you stand with me today? The altars are always open to pray. But as the praise and worship team sings a song, could you worship the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one that is the Son of the living God?